Hello folks, thank you for joining me uh, for this reading on the Freemasonic Knowledge Channel. Hopefully everybody can hear me alright, my mic's uh, up as far as it can go, although lately in videos I've been having some trouble. Uh, so hopefully I'm close, but not too close. And um, this reading... Let's see here. What is this reading? This reading will be the Rosicrucian and Masonic Origins by one Manly P. Hall. And we'll start off with Freemasonry is a fraternity within a fraternity, an outer organization concealing an inner brotherhood of the elect. Before it is possible to intelligently discuss the origin of the craft, it is necessary, therefore, to establish the existence of these two separate, yet inter interdependent orders, the one visible and the other invisible. The visible society is a splendid camaraderie of free and accepted men enjoined to devote themselves to ethical, educational, fraternal, patriotic, and humanitarian concerns. The Invisible Society is a secret and most august fraternity, or august fraternity, whose members are dedicated to the service of a mysterious arcanum and arcanorium. And those brethren who have essayed to write the history of their craft have not included in their disquisitions the story of that truly secret inner society which is to the body of Freemasonic what the heart is to the body human. In each generation only a few are accepted into the inner sanctuary of the work, but these are veritable princes of the truth and their sainted names shall be remembered in future ages together with the seers and prophets of the elder world. Though the great initiate philosophers of Freemasonry can be counted upon one's fingers, yet their power is not to be measured by the achievements of ordinary men. They are dwellers upon the threshold of the innermost masters of that secret doctrine which forms the invisible foundation of every great theological and rational institution. The outer history of the Masonic Order is one of noble endeavor, altruism, and splendid enterprise. The inner history one of silent conquest, persecution, and heroic martyrdom. The body of Masonry rose from the guilds of workmen who wandered the face of medieval Europe. But the spirit of Masonry walked with God before the universe was spread out or the scroll of the heavens unrolled. The enthusiasm of the young mason is the effervescence of the pardonable pride. Let him extol the merits of his craft, reciting its steady growth, its fraternal spirit, and its worthy undertakings. Let him boast of splendid buildings and ever-increasing sphere of influence. These are the tangible evidence of power and should rightly set a flutter the heart of the apprentice who does not fully comprehend as yet that great strength which abides in silence or that unutterable dignity to be sensed only by those who have been raised into the contemplation of the inner mystery. An obstacle well nigh insurmountable is to convince the mason himself that the secrets of his craft are worthy of his profound consideration. As St. Paul, so we are told, kicked against the pricks of conversion, so the rank and file of the present day Masons strenuously oppose any effort put forth to interpret Masonic symbols in the light of philosophy. They are seemingly obsessed by the fear that from their ritualism may be extracted a meaning more profound than is actually contained therein. For years it has been a mooted question whether Freemasonry is actually a religious organization. Masonry, writes Pike, however, in the legend for the 19th degree, has and always had a religious creed. 
It teaches what it deems to be the truth in respect to the nature and attributes of God. The more studi studiously minded uh, Mason regards the craft as an aggregation of thinkers concerned with the deeper mysteries of life. The all too prominent younger members of the fraternity, however, if not openly skeptical, are at least indifferent to these weightier issues. The champions of philosophic, philosophic masonry, alas, are a weak small voice which grows weaker and smaller as time goes by. In fact, there are actual blocks among the brethren who would divorce masonry from both philosophy and religion at any and all cost. If, however, we search the writings of eminent masons, we find a unanimity of viewpoint, namely that masonry is a religious and philosophic body. Every effort initiated to elevate Masonic thought to its true position has thus invariably emphasized that the metaphysical and ethical aspects of the craft. But a superficial pursuit of available documents will demonstrate that the modern Masonic order is not united respecting the true purpose for its own existence, nor will this factor of doubt be dispelled until the origin of the craft is established beyond all quibbling. The elements of masonry or Masonic history are strangely elusive. There are gaps which apparently cannot be bridged. Who the early Freemasons really were states gold in a concise history of Freemasonry and whence they came may afford a tempting theme for inquiry into the speculative antiquity or antiquity. But it is enveloped in obscurity and lies far outside the domain of authentic history. Between modern Freemasonry and its vast body of ancient symbolism and those original mysteries which first employed these symbols, there is a dark interval of centuries. To the conservative Mason historian or Masonic historian, the deductions of such writers as Higgins, Churchward, Vale, and Waite, though ingenious and fascinating, actually prove nothing. That masonry is a body of ancient lore is self-evident, but the tangible link necessary to convince the recalcitrant brethren that their order is the direct successor of the pagan mysteries has unfortunately not been adduced, adduced to date. Sorry. Of such problems as these is composed the angel with which the Masonic Jacob must wrestle throughout the night. It is possible to trace masonry back a few centuries with comparative ease, but then the tread or thread suddenly vanishes from sight in a maze of secret societies and political enterprises. Dimly silhouetted in the mists that becloud these tangled issues are such figures as Cagliostro, uh, Comte de Saint Germain, and Saint Martin. But even the connection between these individuals and the craft has never been clearly defined. The writings of early Masonic history is involved in such obvious hazard as to provoke the widespread conclusion that further search is futile. The average Masonic student is content, therefore, to trace his craft back to the workmen's guilds who chipped and chiseled at the cathedrals and the public buildings of medieval Europe. While such men as Albert Pike have realized this attitude to be ridiculous, it is one thing to declare insufficient and quite another to prove the fallacy to an adamantine mind. Or adamantine mind. So much has been lost and forgotten, so much ruled in and out by those unfitted for such legislative revision that the modern rituals do not in every case represent the original rights of the craft. In his symbolism, Pike, who spent a lifetime in the quest for Masonic secrets, declares that few of the original meanings of the symbols are known to the modern order. Nearly all the so-called interpretations now given being superficial. Pike confessed that the original meanings of the very symbols he himself was attempting to interpret were irretrievably lost.
that even such familiar emblems as the apron and the pillars were locked mysteries whose keys had been thrown away by the uninformed the initiated also writes john fellows as well as those without pale of the order are equally ignorant in their derivation and import see the mysteries of freemasonry preston gould mackey oliver and pike in fact nearly every great historian of freemasonry have all admitted the possibility of the modern society being connected indirectly at least with the ancient mysteries and their descriptions of the modern society are prefaced by excerpts from ancient writings descriptive of primitive ceremonials these eminent masonic scholars have all recognized in the legend of harem abiff an adaptation of the osiris myth nor do they deny that the major part of the symbolism of the craft is derived from the pagan institutions of antiquity when the gods were venerated in secret places with strange figures and appropriate rituals though cognizant of the exalted origin of their order these historians either through fear or uncertainty have failed however to drive home the one point necessary to establish the true purpose of freemasonry they did not realize that the mysteries whose rituals freemasonry perpetuates were the custodians of a secret philosophy of life of such transcendent nature that it can only be entrusted to an individual tested and proved beyond all peradventure of human frailty the secret schools of greece and egypt were neither fraternal nor political fundamentally nor were their ideas similar to those of the modern craft they were essentially philosophic and religious institutions and all admitted into them were consecrated to the service of the sovereign good modern freemasons however regard their craft primarily as neither philosophic nor religious but rather as ethical strange as it may seem the majority openly ridicule the very supernatural powers and agencies for which their symbols stand the secret doctrine that flows through freemasonic symbols and to whose per per perpetuation the invisible masonic body is consecrated has its source in three ancient and exalted orders the first is the diana saic artificers and the second the roman collegia and the third the arabian rosicrucians the dionysians were the master builders of the ancient world originally founded to design and erect the theaters of dionysus wherein they enacted the tragic dramas of the rituals this order was repeatedly elevated by popular acclaim to greater dignity until at last it was entrusted with the planning and construction of all public edifices concerned with the commonwealth or the worship of gods and heroes hiram king of tyre was the patron of the dionysians and who flourished in tyre or tyre and sidon and hiram abiff if we may believe the sacred account was himself a grand master of this most noble order of pagan builders king solomon in his wisdom accepted the services of this famous craftsman and thus at the instigation of hiram king of tyre hiram abiff though himself a member of different faith journeyed from his own country to design and supervise the erection of the everlasting house to the true god on mount moriah the tools of the builder's craft were first employed by the Dionysians as symbols under which to conceal the mysteries of the soul and the secrets of human regeneration the Dionysians also first likened man to a rough ashlar which trued into a finished block through the instrument of reason could be fitted into the structure of that living and eternal temple built without the sound of a hammer the voice of workmen or any tool of contention the roman collegia was a branch of the dionysiacs uh, dionysiacs and to it belonged those initiated artisans who fashioned and in the impressive monuments whose ruins still lend their immortal glory to the eternal city in his ten books of architecture or on architecture uh, vitruvius the initiate of the collegia 
has revealed that which was permissible concerning the secrets of his holy order. Of the inner mysteries, however, he could not write, for these were reserved for such as had donned the leather apron of the craft. In his consideration of the books now available concerning the mysteries, the thoughtful reader should note the following words appearing in the 12th century volume entitled Archiville Liber Secretis, or Secretis, yeah, something like that, uh, Secretis, uh, and I quote on this, is uh, out of that book, is not this an art full of secrets? And believest thou, O fool, that we plainly teach this secrets of secrets, taking our words according to their literal interpretation? C. Sephar H. Debarum. And into the stones they trued, the adepts of collegiate deeply carved their Gnostic symbols. From earliest times, the initiated stonecutters marked their perfected works with the secret emblems of their crafts and degrees, that unborn generations might realize that the master builders of the first ages also labored for the same ends sought by men today. The mystery, mysteries of Egypt and Persia that had found a haven in the Arabian desert reached Europe by way of the Knights Templars and the Rosicrucians. The Temple of the Rose Cross at Damascus had persevered or preserved sorry, the secret philosophy of Sharon's Rose. The Druses or Druids Druses of the Lebanon still retained the mysticism of the ancient Syria, and the dervishes which they lean on their carved and crooked crotched sticks still meditate, meditate upon the secret instruction perpetuated from the days of the four caliphs. From the far places of Iraq and the hidden retreats of the Sufi mystics, the ancient wisdom thus found its way into Europe. Was Jacques de Molay burned by the Holy Inquisition merely because he wore the Red Cross of the Templar? What were those secrets to which he was true even in death? Did his companion knights perish with him merely because they had amassed a fortune and exercised an unusual degree of temporal power? To the thoughtless these may constitute ample grounds, but to those who can pierce the film of the specious and the superficial they are assuredly insufficient. It was not the physical power of the Templars but the knowledge which they had brought with them from the east that the church feared. The Templars had discovered part of the great arcanum, and they had become wise in those mysteries which had been celebrated in Mecca thousands of years before the advent of Mohammed. They had read a few pages from the dread book of Anthropos, and for this knowledge they were doomed to die. What was the black magic of which the Templars were accused? What was Baphomet, the goat of Mendes, whose mysteries they were declared to have celebrated? All these are questions worthy of the thoughtful consideration of every studious mason. Truth is eternal. The so-called revelations of truth that come in different religions are actually but a re-emphasis of an ever-existing doctrine. Thus Moses did not originate a new religion for Israel. He simply adapted the mysteries of Egypt to the needs of Israel. The ark triumphantly borne by the twelve tribes through the wilderness was copied after the Isaiah ark, which may still be traced in faint, hast relief, upon the ruins of the temple of Phale. Even the two brooding cherubim over the mercy seat are visible in the Egyptian carving furnishing indubitable evidence that the secret doctrine of Egypt was the prototype of Israel's mystery religion. In this reformation of Indian philosophy, Buddha likewise did not reject the esotericism of the Brahmins, but rather adapted his, this esotericism to the needs of the masses in India. The mystic secrets locked within the Holy Vedas were thus disclosed in order that all men, irrespective of castly distinction, might partake of wisdom and share in a common heritage of good. 
Jesus was a rabbin of the Jews, a teacher of the holy law, who discoursed in the synagogue, interpreting the Torah according to the teachings of his sect. He brought no new message, nor were his reformations radical. He merely tore away the veil from the temple, in order that not only the Pharisee and Sadducee, uh, uh, Sadducee, uh, also uh, publican and sinner might together behold the glory of an ages, ageless faith. In his cavern on my, Mount Hira, Muhammad prayed not for the new truths, but for the old truths to be restated in their original purity, and simply in order that men might understand again that primitive religion. God's clear revelation to the first patriarchs, the mysteries of Islam, had been celebrated in the great black cube of the Kaaba centuries before the holy pilgrimage. The prophet was but the reformer of a decadent pag pagandom, a smasher of idols, the purifier of defiled mysteries. The dervishes who patterned their garments after those of the prophet still preserved that inner teaching of the elect, and for them the axis of the earth, the supreme hierophant, still sits, visibly only to the faithful, in meditation upon the flat roof of the Kaaba. Neither carpenter nor camel driver, as Abdul Baha might have said, can fashion a world religion from the substances of his own mind. Neither prophet nor savior preached a doctrine which was his own, but in language suitable to his time, and race retold that ancient wisdom preserved within the mysteries since the dawning of human consciousness. So with the Masonic mysteries of today, each mason has at hand those lofty principles of universal order upon whose certainties and the faith of mankind have ever been established. So, all right, hold on. All the periods and, and stuff are in the wrong place in that sentence. Sorry about that. Masons have those lofty prints of universal order upon whose certainties of faith of, of mankind have never, ever been established. And see, I got a cat distracting me too. Cricket, I'm going to spray you with water if you don't lay down and shut up for another few minutes at least. All right. Uh, sorry, folks. Okay, so with the Masonic mysteries of today, yeah, okay, certainty ever been established. Each Mason has at hand those lofty principles of universal order upon pregnant with life and hope to those millions who wander in the darkness of unenlightenment. It's all right, Green, I'm not going to spray you. You're fine. <laughs> Father CRC, the master of the Rose Cross, was initiated into the great work at De Damkar, Damkar, and uh, later at Fez, further information was given him relating to the sorcery of the Arabians. From these wizards of the desert, CRC also secured the sacred book M, which is declared to have contained the accumulated knowledge of the world. This volume was translated into Latin by CRC for the edification of his order, but only the initiates know the present hidden repository of the Rosicrucian manuscripts charters and manifestos from the arabians crc also learned of the elemental peoples and how with their aid it was possible to gain admission to the ethereal world where dealt the jinn and the nature spirits crc thus discovered that the magical creatures of the arabian nights entertainment actually existed though invisible to the ordinary mortal from astro astrologers living in the desert, far from the concourse of the marketplace, he was further instructed concerning the mysteries of the stars and the virtues uh, resident in the astral light, the rituals of magic and invocation, and the preparation of therapeutic talismans and the binding of the jinn. All right, you people follow me now? You, are you with me? Are you catching all this? CRC had become an adept, adept in the gathering of medicinal herbs, the transmutation of the metals, and the manufacture of precious gems by artificial means. Even the secret of the elixir of life and the universal panacea uh, were communicated to him. Enriched thus beyond the dreams of Corossus, 
The holy master returned to Europe and there established the house of wisdom which he called Domus Sancti Spiritus. And this house he enveloped in clouds, it is said, so that men could not discover it. What are these clouds, however, but the rituals and symbols under which is concealed the great arcanum? that unspeakable mystery which every true mason must seek if he would become in reality a prince of the royal secret. Paracelsus, Paracelsus, uh, Paracelsus, Par I don't know, I, I probably pronounced it right the first time, I wasn't trying to think about it. Uh, the Swiss Hermes was initiated into the secrets of alchemy in Constantinople, and there beheld the consummation of the magnum opus. He is consequently entitled to be mentioned among those initiated by the Arabians into the Rosicrucian work. Cagliostro was also initiated by the Arabians, and because of the knowledge he had thus secured, incurred the displeasure of the Holy See, and from the unprobed depths of Arabian Rosicrucianism, also issued the illustrious Comte Saint G. Germain, or de Saint Germain, sorry, over whose Masonic activities to this day hangs the veil of impenetrable mystery. The exalted body of initiates whom he represented, as well as the mission he came to accomplish, have both been concealed from the members of the craft at large, and are apparent only to those few discerning masons who sense the supernal philosophic destiny of their fraternity. The modern Masonic order can be traced back to a period of European history famous for its intrigue, both political and sociological. Between the years 1600 and 1800, mysterious agents moved across the face of the continent. The forerunner of the modern thought was beginning to make its appearance and all Europe was passing through the throes of eternal dissension and reconstruction. Democracy was in its infancy, yet its potential power was already being felt. Thrones were being, beginning to totter. And the aristocracy of Europe was like the old man on Sinbad's back. It was becoming more unbearable with every passing day. Although upon the surface national governments were seemingly able to cope with the situation, there was a definite undercurrent of impending change, and out of the masses, long patient and under the yoke of oppression, were rising up the champions of religious, philosophic, and political liberty. These led to the, these led the factions of the dissatisfied people with the legitimate grievances against the intolerance of the church and the oppression of the crown, out of this struggle for the expression materialized certain definite ideas, the same which have now come to be considered peculiarly Masonic. The divine prerogatives of humanity were being crushed out by the three great powers of ignorance, superstition, and fear. Ignorance, the power of the mob, fear, the power of the despot, and superstition, the power of the church. Between the thinker and the personal liberty do, loomed the three ruffians or the personifications of the impediment, or impediment and the torch, the crown, and the tiara. Brute force, kingly power, and ecclesiastical persuasion became the agents of great oppression and the motive of a deep unrest, the deterrent to all progress. It was unlawful to think, well nigh fatal to philosophize, and a rank heresy to doubt. To question the infallibility of the existing order was to invite the persecution of the church and the state. These together incited the populace, which thereupon played the role of executioner for these arch enemies of human liberty. Thus, the idea of democracy assumed a definite form during these stormy periods of European history. This democracy was not only a vision, but a retrospection. Not only a looking forward, but a gazing backward upon better days and an effort to project those better days into an unborn tomorrow. The ethical, political, and philosophical institutions of antiquity, with their constructive effect upon the whole structure of the state, were noble examples of possible conditions. It became the dream of the oppressed, consequently, to re-establish a golden age upon the earth, an age where the thinker could think in safety and the dreamer dream in peace, when the wise 
should lead the simple and the simple follow yet all dwell together in fraternity and industry industry during this period several books were in circulation which to a certain degree registered the pulse of the time one of these documents moore's utopia was the picture of a new age when heavenly conditions should prevail upon the earth this idea of establishing good in the world savored of blasphemy however for in that day heaven alone it was assumed could be good men did not seek to establish heavenly conditions on earth but rather earthly conditions in heaven According to popular concept, the more the individual suffered the torments of the damned upon earth, the more he would enjoy the blessedness of heaven. Life was a period of chastisement, and earthly happiness was an unattainable mirage. Moore's utopia thus came as a definite blow to the autocratic pretensions and attitudes, giving impulses to the material emphasis which was to follow in succeeding centuries. Another prominent figure of this period was Sir Walter Raleigh, who paid with his life for high treason against the crown. Raleigh was tried, and though the charge was never proved, was executed. Before Raleigh went to trial, it was known that he must die, and that no defense could save him. His treason against the crown was of a character very different, however, from that which history records. Raleigh was a member of a secret society or body of men who were already moving irresistibly forward under the banner of democracy, and for that affiliation he died a felon's death. The actual reason for Raleigh's death sentence was his refusal to reveal the identity either of that great political organization of which he was a member, or his confreres who were fighting the dogma of faith and the divine right of kings. On the title page of the first edition of Raleigh's History of the World, we accordingly find a mass of intricate emblems framed between two great columns. When the executioner sealed his lips forever, Raleigh's silence, while it added to the discomfiture of his persecutors, assured the safety of his colleagues. One of the truly great minds of that secret fraternity, in fact the moving spirit of the whole enterprise, was Sir Francis Bacon whose prophecy of the coming age forms the theme of his new Atlantis, and whose vision of that reformation of knowledge finds expression in the Novum Organum Scientarium, and the new organ, or the new organ, of science or thought. And that new Atlantis that they speak of in this time is us, the USA, the American colony. I, I, we'll probably get to that. I'm probably jumping the gun as usual. In the engraving at the beginning of the latter volume may be seen the little ship of progressivism sailing out between the pillars of Galen and Avincia, Vicina, and venturing forth beyond the imaginary pillars of church and state upon the unknown sea of human liberty. It is significant that Bacon was appointed by the British crown to protect its interests in the new American colonies beyond the sea. We find him writing of this new land, dreaming of the day when a new world and a new government of philosophic elect should be established there, and scheming to consummate that end when the time should be right. Upon the title page of the 1640 edition of Bacon's Advancement of Learning is a Latin motto to the effect that he was the third great mind since Plato. Bacon was a member of the same group to which Sir Walter Raleigh belonged, but Bacon's position as Lord High Chancellor protected him from Raleigh's fate. Every effort was made, however, to humiliate and discredit him. At last, in the 66th year of his life, having completed the work which held him in England, Bacon feigned death and passed over into Germany there to guide the destinies of his philosophic and political fraternity for nearly 25 years uh, before his actual demise occurred. Another notable characters, uh, other notable characters of the period are Montaigne, Ben Johnson, Marlowe, and the great Franz Joseph of Transylvania, and the latter one of the most important, as well as active figures in all his drama, a man who ceased fighting Austria to retire into a monastery in Transylvania from which to direct the activities of his secret society, 
one political upheaval followed another, the grand climax of his political unrest culminating in the French Revolution, which was directly precipitated by the attacks upon the person of Alessandro Cagliostro and uh, the divine Cagliostro, by far the most picturesque character of the time, has the distinction of being more malign than any other person of history. Tried by the Inquisition for founding a Masonic lodge in the city of Rome, Cagliostro was sentenced to die, a sentence later commuted by the Pope to life imprisonment in the old castle of San Leo. Shortly after his incarceration, Cagliostro disappeared and the story was circulated that he had been strangled in an attempt to escape from prison. In reality, however, he was liberated and returned to his masters in the east. But Cagliostro, the idol of France, surnamed the father of the poor, who never received anything from anyone and gave everything to everyone, was most adequately revenged. Though the people little understood this inexhaustible pitcher of bounty which poured forth benefits and never required replenishment, they remembered him in the day of their power. Cagliostro founded the Egyptian Rite of Freemasonry, which received into its mysteries many of the French nobility and was regarded favorably by the most learned minds of Europe. Having established the Egyptian Rite, Cagliostro declared himself to be an agent of the Order of the Knights Templar and to have received initiation from them on the Isle of Malta. See Morals and Dogmen, which Albert Pike quotes, Elifus Light Levi on Cagliostro's affiliation with the Templars. Called upon Pike's quotes, Elifus uh, Levi on, uh, whoops, called upon the, car sorry, called upon the carpet by the Supreme Council of France, it was demanded of Cagliostro that he prove by what authority he had founded a Masonic Lodge in Paris independent of the Grand Orient. Of such surpassing mentality was Cagliostro, Cagliostro, that the Supreme Council found it difficult to secure an advocate qualified to discuss with Cagliostro philosophic masonry and the ancient mysteries he claimed to represent. The court de Glen Jeblin, Jeblin, uh, or Gebelin, whatever, uh, the greatest Egyptologist of his day, had an authority on the ancient philosophies, was chosen as the outstanding scholar. A time was set, and the brethren convened. Attired in an oriental coat and a pair of violet-colored breeches, Cagliostro was hailed before this council of his peers, and, court, and the court de Giblin uh, asked three questions and then sat down, admitting himself disqualified to interrogate the man, so much his superior in every branch of learning. Cagliostro then took the floor, revealing to the assembled Masons not only his personal qualifications, but prophesying the future of France. He foretold the fall of the French throne, the reign of terror, and the fall of Bastille. And at a later time, <clears throat> he revealed the date of the death of Marie Antoinette and the king, and also the advent of Napoleon. Having finished his address, Cagliostro made a spectacular exit, leaving the French Masonic Lodge in consternation and utterly incapable of coping with the profundity of his reasoning. Though no longer regarded as a ritual in Freemasonry, the Egyptian rite is available, and all who read it will recognize its author to have been no more a Charlton than was Plato. Charlton. Um... Then appears that charming first American gentleman, Dr. Benjamin Franklin, who together with Marquise Le de, uh, de, Marquise Le de Lafayette, sorry man, played an important role in this drama of empires. While in France, Dr. Franklin was privileged to receive definite esoteric instruction. It is noteworthy that Franklin was the first in America to reprint Anderson's Constitutions of the Freemasons, which is the most prized work on the subject, though its accuracy is disputed. Through all this stormy period, these impressive figures come and go, 
part of a definite organization of political and religious thought, a functioning body of philosophers represented in Spain by no less than an individual, no less an individual than Cervantes, in France by Cagliostro, and Saint Germain, in Germany by Gitchell and Andrea, and in England by Bacon, Moore, and Raleigh, and in America by Washington and Franklin. Coincident with the Baconian agitation in England, the famas fraternit, fraternitas, fraternitatis, sorry, again, and confessio fraternitatis appeared in Germany, both of these works being contributions to the establishment of a philosophic government upon the earth. One of the outstanding links between the Rosicrucian mysteries of the Middle Ages and modern masonry is Elijah, Elias sorry, Ashmole, the historian of the Order of the Garter, and the first Englishman to compile the alchemical writings of the English chemists. The foregoing may seem to be a useless recital of inanities, but its purpose is to impress upon the reader's mind the philosophical and political situation in Europe at the time of the inception of the Masonic Order. The philosophic clan, as it were, which had moved across the face of Europe under such names as the Illuminati and the Rosicrucians, had undermined in a subtle manner the entire structure of regal and sacerdotal supremacy. Um, the founders of Freemasonry were all men who were more or less identified with the progressive tendencies of their day. Mystics, philosophers, and alchemists were all bound together with a secret tie and dedicated to the emancipation of humanity from ignorance and oppression. In my researches among ancient books and manuscripts, I have pieced together a little story of probabilities which has a direct bearing upon the subject. Long before the establishment of Freemasonry as a fraternity, a group of mystics founded in Europe what was called the Society of Unknown Philosophers. Prominent among the profound thinkers who formed the membership of this society were the alchemists who were engaged in transmuting the political and religious base metal of Europe into ethical and spiritual gold. The Kabbalists who, as investigators of the superior orders of nature, sought to discover a stable foundation for human government, and lastly the astrologers, who from a study of the procession of the heavenly bodies hoped to find therein the rational archetype for all mundane procedure. Here and there is to be found a character who contacted this society. By some it is believed that both Martin Luther and also that great mystic Philip Melanchthon Methacon were connected with it. Um, first edition of the King James Bible, which was edited by Francis Bacon and prepared under Masonic supervision, bears more Mason's marks than the Cathedral of Strasbourg. The same is true respecting the Masonic symbolism found in the first English edition of Josephus' History of the Jews. For some time, the Society of Unknown Philosophers, and that is true, by the way. Everything I just read is true. Everything I'm reading in here is true. Everything he's saying in this book is true. Manly P. Hall. Okay. For some time, the Society of Un Unknown Philosophers moved extraneous to the church. Among the fathers of the church, however, were a great number of scholarly and intelligent men who were keenly interested in philosophy and ethics, prominent among them being the Jesuit father, Athanasius, Athanasius Kircher, who is recognized as one of the great scholars of his day, both a Rosicrucian and also a member of the Society of Unknown Philosophers, as revealed by the cryptograms in his writings, Kircher was in harmony with this program of philosophic reconstruction. Since learning was largely limited to churchmen, this body of philosophers soon developed an overwhelming preponderance of ecclesi ecclesiastics in its membership. The original anti -eccles ecclesiastical ideas of the society were thus speedily reduced to an innocuous state, 
and the organization gradually converted into an actual auxiliary of the church. A small portion of the membership, however, ever maintained an aloofness from the literary of the faith, and it represented an unorthodox class, the alchemists, Rosicrucians, Kabbalists, and magicians. This latter group accordingly retired from the outer body of the society that had thus become or to be known as the Order of the Golden and Rose Cross, and whose adepts were elevated to the dignity of Knights of the Golden Stone. Upon the withdrawal of these initiated adepts, a powerful clerical body remained which possessed considerable of the ancient lore, but in many instances lacked the keys by which this symbolism could be interpreted. As this body continued to increase in temporal power, its philosophical power grew correspondingly less. The smaller group of adepts that had withdrawn from the order remained inactive, apparently having retired to what they termed the House of the Holy Spirit, where they were enveloped by certain mists impenetrable to the eyes of the profane. Among these reclusive adepts, must be included such well-known Rosicrucians as Robert Flood, uh, Ingenious uh, Philanthes, I don't know how to pronounce that, sorry, John Hayden, Michael Meyer, uh, Henry Kunruth, and uh, these adepts in their retirement constitute a loosely organized society which, though lacking the solidarity, of the definite fraternity occasionally initiated in a candidate and met annually at a specified place. It was the Comte de Chazelle, an initiate of this order, who raised Dr. Sig Sigismund uh, Baxter while the latter was on the Isle of Meritius. In due time, the original members of the order passed on after first entrusting their secrets to carefully chosen successors. In the meantime, a group of men in England, under the leadership of such mystics as Ashmole and Flood, had resolved upon repopularizing the ancient learning and reclassifying philosophy in accordance with Bacon's plan for a world encyclopedia. These men had undertaken to reconstruct ancient Platonic and Gnostic mysticism, and were able to or but were able to attain their objective for lack of information or unable to attain it for lack of information uh, Elias Ashmole may have been a member of the European order of Rosicrucians and as such evidently knew that in various parts of Europe there were isolated individuals who were in possession of the secret doctrine handed down in unbroken line from the ancient Greeks and Egyptians through Boetus um, of Boetius and the early Christian church and the Arabians. The efforts of the English group to contact such individuals were evidently successful. Several initiated Rosicrucians were brought from the mainland to England where they remained for a considerable time designing the symbolism of Freemasonry and incorporating into the rituals of the order the same divine principles and philosophy that had formed the inner doctrine of all the great soci secret societies from the time of the Illusionia in Greece. In fact, the Illusionian mysteries themselves continued in Christendom until the 6th century after Christ, after which they passed into custody of the Arabians, as attested by the presence of the Masonic symbols and figures upon early Mohammedan, Mohammedan monuments, or Muhammad monuments. The adepts brought over from the continent to sit in council with the English philosophers were the initiates of the Arabian rites, and thus through them the mysteries were ultimately returned to Christendom. Upon completion by the, of the bylaws of the new fraternity, the initiates retired again into Central Europe, leaving a group of disciples to develop the outer organization, which was to function as a sort of screen to conceal the activities of the esoteric order. And it's not just a screen, it's, it's a, a, a uh, uh, what's the term? Uh, uh, I'll say my mind went blank. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's a recruiting method too, and and a uh, uh, a testing. Uh, 
because you know only certain people rise to that uh, level only certain people have the interest and uh, intelligence and uh, you know motivation to uh, take that extra step in, in learning the mysteries all right so such in brief is the story to be pieced together from the fragmentary bits of evidence available the whole structure of freemasonry is founded upon the activities of the secret society in central european of central european adepts whom the studious mason will find to be the definite link between the modern craft and the ancient wisdom the outer body of masonic philosophy was merely the veil of this cabalistic order whose members were the custodians of the true arcanum does this inner and or, uh, secret brotherhood of initiates still exist independent of the Freemasonic order? Evidence points to the fact that it does. For these august adepts are the actual preservers of those secret operative processes of the Greeks, whereby the illumination and completion of the individual is effected. They are the veritable guardians of the lost word the keepers of the inner mysteries, and the mason who searches for and discovers them is rewarded beyond all mortal estimation. Let that sink in for a minute. In the preface to a book entitled Long Livers, published in 1772, Eugenius uh, Philanthius or Philanthius Blimps or whatever uh, the Rosicrucian initiate thus <laughs> addressed is his brethren of the most ancient and most honorable fraternity of Freemasons remember that you are the salt of the earth the light of the world and the fire of the universe you are living stones built up a spiritual house who believe and rely on the chief Lathis and Glaris which the refractory and disobedient builders disallow you are called from darkness to light. You are chosen generation, a royal priesthood. This makes you, my dear brethren, fit companions for the greatest kings, and no wonder since the king of kings hath consented you to make you so, so to himself, compared to whom the mightiest and most haughty princes of the earth are but as worms, and that's not so much as we are all sons of the same one eternal father by whom all things were made but inasmuch as we do the will of his and our father which is in heaven you see now your high dignity you see what you are act accordingly and show yourselves what you are men and walk worthy the high profession to which you are called so remember then that the great end we all aim at is is not to be happy here and hereafter for they both depend on each other is it not to be happy here and hereafter for they both depend on each other the seeds of that eternal peace and tranquility and everlasting repose must be sown in this life and he that would glorify and enjoy the sovereign good then must learn to do it now and from contemplating the creature gradually ascended to the adore to adore the creator so of all the obstacles to surmount in matters of rationality and the most difficult is that of prejudice even the casual observer must realize that the true wealth of freemasonry lies in its mysticism the average masonic scholar however is fundamentally opposed to the mystical interpretations of his symbols for he shares the attitude of the modern mind and its general antipathy towards transcendentalism transcendentalism and, and transcendence and the most significant fact however is that those masons who have won sing, signal off honors for their contributions to the craft have been transcendentalists almost without exception it is quite incredible moreover that any initiated brother when presented with a copy of morals and dogma upon the confirmment of his 14th degree can read that volume and yet maintain that his order is not identical with the mystery schools of the first ages 
Much of the writings of Albert Pike are extracted from the books of the French magician Eliphas Levi and uh, one of the greatest transcendentalists of modern times. Levi was an occultist, a metaphysician, and a platonic philosopher who by the rituals of magic invoked even the spirit of Apollonius of Tiana, and yet Pike has inserted in his morals and dogma whole pages and even chapters practically verbatim. And that's a very long book. It's one that I unfortunately would not ever be able to read. I have it, but I won't be able to read it here. Not that you would need to, but uh, I do want to point out the 14th degree is, is, is conferred. And I've, I've told this to other people before. That's, that's Most people, most of your common Blue Lodge uh, Masons never aspire to go past the third degree. Because that's when you're the third degree, you're Master Mason. And you're a part of the fraternity. And usually most people are content with that social uh, body and fraternity at that level. Uh, only those few who keep on going. So then when you get to the 14th, like I've told many people before in conversations, that's when you have to make the choice. That's when you find out the truth of who you're actually serving and the things that you have to actually do to to gain the type of illumination that they think they're gaining. And, um, you know, you make that choice. So, all right, to continue, to Pike, the following remarkable tribute was paid by Sterling Kerr, Jr., 33rd degree deputy for an inspector general of the District of Columbia upon crowning with the laurel the bust of Pike in the House of the Temple. Pike was an oracle greater than that of Delphi. He was truth's minister and priest. His victories were those of peace. Long may his memory live in the hearts of the brethren affectionately termed Albertus Magnus by his admirers. Uh, admirers. Pike wrote of Hermeticism and alchemy and hinted at the mysteries of the temple. Through his zeal and unflagging energy, American Freemasonry was raised from comparative obscurity to become the most powerful organization in the land. Though Pike, a transcendental thinker, was the recipient of every honor that the Freemasonic bodies of the world could confer, the modern Mason is loath to admit that transcendentalism has any place in Freemasonry. This is an attitude filled with embarrassment and inconsistency. For whichever the way, way the Mason turns, he is confronted by these inescapable issues of philosophy and the mysteries. Yet with all, he dismisses the entire sub... <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, entire subject as being more or less a survival of primitive superstitions. At this point, I'm going to have to stop for a drink of water here. A lot of people think this reading stuff is is easy, and and maybe for a talker, it is. But I'm not a talker, so when I talk for a long time, my uh emphysema starts acting up and everything else <laughs> um because i don't normally talk a lot okay so these longer books I'm, I'm sorry it gets like this towards the end but i do the best i can folks okay so yet with all he dismisses the entire subject of uh, uh being more or less a survival of primitive uh superstitions you know people scared of the uh, of what I was just talking about, basically. Mason who, who would discover the lost word must remember, however, that in the first ages, every neophyte was a man of profound learning and unimpeachable character, who, for the sake of wisdom and virtue, had faced death unafraid and had triumphed over those limitations of the flesh which bind most mortals to the sphere of mediocrity. In those days, the rituals were not put on by degree teams who handled candidates as though they were perishable commodities, but by priests deeply versed in the lore of their cults. Not one Freemason out of a thousand could have survived the initiations of the pagan rites, for the tests were given in those strenuous days when men were men and death the reward of failure. 
The neophyte of the Druid mysteries was set adrift in a small boat to battle with the stormy sea, and unless his knowledge of natural law enabled him to quell the storm as did Jesus upon the Sea of Galilee, he returned no more. In the Egyptian rites of Seraphis, it was uh, required of the neophyte that he cross an unbridged chasm in the temple floor. In other words, if unable by magic to sustain himself in the air without visible support, he fell headlong into a volcanic crevice, there to die of heat and suffocation. In one part of the Mithraic rites, the candidate seeking admission to the inner sanctuary was required to pass through a closed door by dematerialization. So, okay, you know, and you, a lot of people that's listening now, you, you may, you know, but up top when I said pay attention, you know, to, and they was talking about astral and they was talking about ethereal and they were talking about spirits and stuff, okay, and now they're talking about, uh, you know, everything from, you know, uh, levitation to uh, uh, control over uh, the elements to uh, materializing and dematerializing, okay? And they take this stuff seriously. A lot of people think this is fantasy flop heart when they hear it coming out of Hollywood or whatever. They don't realize that magic is real. You actually live in a world of magic what would be known as magic. It's a science, but to the profane, it's magic. The philosopher who has the authenticated uh, has authenticated the reality of ordeals such as these no longer entertains the popular error that the performance of miracles is confined solely to biblical characters. Do you still ask, right, Pike, writes Pike, if it has its secrets and mysteries? It is certain that something in the ancient initiations was regarded as of immense value by such intellects as Herodotus, Plutarch, and Cicero. The magicians of Egypt were able to imitate several of the miracles wrought by Moses, and the science of the Hierophants of the Mysteries produced effects that to the initiated seemed mysterious and supernatural. It becomes self-evident that he who passed successfully through these artist tests, involving both natural and also supernatural hazards, was a man apart in his community. Such an initiate was deemed to be more than human, for he had achieved where countless ordinary mortals, having failed, had returned no more. Let us hear the words of Ephuvius, and when admitted into the temple of Isis, as recorded in the Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass. And then also the priests, all the profane being removed, taking hold of me by the hand, brought me to the penetralia of the temple, clothed in a new linen garment. Perhaps, inquisitive reader, you will very anxiously ask me what was then said and done. I would tell you, if it could be lawfully told, you should know it, if it was lawful for you to hear it. But both ears and tongue are guilty of rash curiosity. Nevertheless, I will not keep you in suspense with religious desire, nor torment you with long-continued anxiety. Hear, therefore, the belief, and believe. Hear, therefore, but believe what is true. I approach to the confines of death, and having trod on the threshold of prosperifying, I returned from it, being carried through all the elements. At midnight I saw the sun shining with its splendid light, and I manifestly drew near to the gods, to the gods. Hold on, let me, hold on, let me make sure I didn't lose my place. No, that's what it says. I manifestly drew near to the gods beneath, the gods and the gods above. Okay. The gods beneath and the gods above, and proximately adored them. Behold, I have narrated to you things of which, though heard, it is nevertheless necessary that you should be ignorant. I will therefore only relate that which may be enunciated to the understanding of the profane without a crime. That's my crime. <laughs> I'm telling you this, right? Kings and princes paid homage to the initiate, the newborn man, 
the favored of the gods, the initiate had actually entered into the presence of the divine beings. He had died and been raised again into the radiant sphere of everlasting light. Seekers after wisdom journeyed across the great continents to hear his words and his sayings were treasured with the revelations of oracles. It was even esteemed an honor to receive from such one an inclination of the head, a kindly smile, or a gesture of approbation. That, that's how people act when, when they get recognition from judges, right? If a judge notices the, the lawyer or the, the people outside the courtroom, people just like almost practically fall at the judge's feet. They're like, oh my gosh, he's talking to me. Anyway, disciples gladly paid with their lives for the master's word of praise and died of a broken heart at his rebuke. On one occasion, Pythagoras became momentarily irritated because of the seemingly stupidity of one of his students. <laughs> the master's displeasure so preyed upon the mind of the humiliated youth that drawing a knife from the folds of his garments, he committed suicide. So greatly moved was Pythagoras by the incident that never from that time on was he known to lose patience with any of his followers, regardless of the provocation. With a smile of paternal indulgence in the venerable master, who senses the true dignity of the mystic tie, should gravely incline the minds of the brethren towards the sublimer issues of the crash, craft. The officer who would serve his lodge most effectively must realize that he is of an order apart from other men, that he is the keeper of an awful secret, and that the chair upon which he sits is the seat of immortals, and that if he would be worthy successor to those master masons of other ages, his thoughts must be measured by the profundity of Pythagoras and the lucidity of Plato. Enthroned in the radiant east, the worshipful master is the light of his lodge. And that now you know why they go to the east, and why the east is important. Uh, after reading all this, I'm sorry, I don't have more notes of myself. The worshipful master is the light of his lodge, the representative of the gods, and one of that long line of hierophants who, through the blending of their rational powers with the reason of the ineptitude, ineffable, have been accepted into the great school, and this high priest, after an ancient order, must realize that those before him are not merely a gathering of properly tested men, but the custodians of an eternal lore, and the guardians of a sacred truth, the perpetrators of an ageless wisdom, and the consecrated servants of a living God the wardens of a supreme mystery. A new day is dawning for Freemasonry from the insufficiency of theology and the hopelessness of materialism. Men are turning to seek the God of philosophy. In this new era wherein the old order of things is breaking down and the individual is rising triumphant above the monotony of the masses, there is much work to be accomplished. The temple builder is needed as never before. A great reconstruction period is at hand, and the debris of a fallen culture must be cleared away. The old footings must be found again, that the new temple significant of a new revelation of law may be raised thereon. This is the peculiar work of the builder. This is the high duty for which he was called out of the world. This is the noble enterprise for which he was raised and given the tools of his craft. By thus doing his part in the reorganization of society, the workman may earn his wages as all good masons should. The new light, and you see how deceptive this is? And see how they mix it up? They make it look, sound like you're working for God to build the world, right? <laughs> Come on, man. Anybody who follows Jesus knows that he's not of the world. He, not, he didn't come here to save the world. <laughs> so, okay. That's my little ditty for the point of why I actually am reading this to you and, 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 uh, and uh, revealing this knowledge and even and even created this channel. You can't follow Christ and uh, play the witchcraft game and play the world game and be a Freemason and and, and, and fool yourself into thinking that you're doing some great work when you're not. You're, 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 you're breaking every cardinal sin there is, is what you're doing. From the minute you take your very first oath.
All right. So by thus doing his part in the reorganization of society, the workman may earn his wages as all good masons should. A new light is breaking in the East. A more glorious day is at hand. The rule of the philosophic elect, the dream of the ages, will be yet realized and is not far distant. To her loyal sons, Freemasonry sends its cl this clarion call. Arise ye, the day of labor is at hand. The great work awaits completion and the days of man's life are few like the singing guildsmen of bygone days the craft of builders marches victoriously down the broad avenues of time their song is of labor and glorious endeavor their anthem is of toil and industry they rejoice in their noble destiny for they are the builders of cities the hewers of worlds the master craftsmen of the universe they're he men I'm he men Master of the Universe. Yes, that's me. <laughs> and thank you folks for joining me. Hope you had a good time.